Thank you, Professor Matais, for that insightful and engaging presentation. Uh, now we go to the roundtable discussion because we have not enough time now to the question. If we prefer, I think it's prefer, uh, preferably to to move on to the the round table and later start with the question because uh, we have we are very sorry for this. Don't worry. Okay, I think it's better to move on to the round table discussion and later your question for the presentation of the our speaker. Uh, you can you can do it. Uh, I would like I would like to present the the rest of the participants of the round table, and uh, I start with Cristina Ponte. Cristina Ponte began her academic journey in 2004, securing a scholarship for a master in environmental science at the Mediterranean Agronomic Institute in Greece. She earned her PhD at the Institute of Natural Resources and Agrobiology in Sevilla, Spain. In 2011, she uh, relocated to Australia, where she worked at the University of Melbourne. In 2019, she returns to, Sp to Spain, and currently she is a senior researcher at the Institute of Forest Research, ec 4 where she has integrated her expertise to study the effect of fire on climate change, on soil biodiversity, and plant soil interactions. Ramiro Oliveri is our second uh, participant in the round table. He is forest engineer. He holds a master's degree in forest engineering at the University of Valladolid. And currently, he serves as head of service in the General Secretariat for Clean Air and Industrial Sustainability at the Ministry for the Ecological Transit Transition of the Spain government, MITECO. And she is responsible for the LULUC sector, land use, land use change, and forestry. And finally, we have Rodrigo Anton. Rodrigo Anton is agricultural engineer. He holds a master's degree in territorial development and public policy at the Mediterranean Agronomic Institute of Montpellier. And currently, uh, after a postdoctoral study in the National Research Institute of Agriculture, Food and the Environment in Orleans, France, he joined the science department of the Public University of Navarra as assistant professor in soil science. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank all of you for accepting to participate in this roundtable. And now uh, I would like to turn the discussion over to the participants in the roundtable. My first question is directed to Professor Matthijs. In your presentation, we have seen that uh, wood fires uh, affect soils properties, but when we want to restore a burn area, what factors should be considered? And in your opinion, we can see in the presentation, is restoration always necessary or, or not? Well, I can start by, by, the, by the end. So, no, not always is necessary, in my opinion. And even in an area that has been burned, maybe it's only necessary in some parts of the, of the area, depending on the factors of, uh, like, uh, there's the slopes, the type of soil, the, the history of the fire. We have to do an evaluation, uh, like uh, if, if you are a doctor and you go to the doctor and say, I am ill, what they have to, to do? Take a pill or nothing? If you are good, it's better, or you are with enough health, it's better to do, don't take a pill. So the best is to do an evaluation of all the area and think uh, maybe we need for a short term do uh, um, an emergency emergency uh, treatment only in this part because there are a lot of risks over ocean but then not in, in the others in a in a medium term maybe trying to be how is recovering the soil and vegetation maybe you have to plant something or maybe we have to remove something because there are a lot of a very good re regeneration with a lot of density and in a long term, to think about how we want to have the forest managed for for avoid the catastrophic type of fires, not the fires. Thank you, Professor Matthijs, for sharing your perspective. Uh, today, we have learned uh, a lot about the effect of fire on the physical, chemical, and biological properties of soils. 
but soy is are alive. It's truly surprising that a teaspoon of healthy soy is contained between 100 million or 1 billion microorganisms. I want to focus my next question uh, on the soy microorganism. And it is addressed to Cristina Aponte. Uh, what is the main impact of fire in soil microorganisms, in your opinion? Yes. Thank you very much, Belen, Elena. It's a pleasure. Can you hear me now? Now? Much better. I'm going to go again, and I'm going to thank you, Belen, Elena, and all the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. There's a bit of a B in the end. It's, I'm not sure if I, it's the only me that I can hear, but I hope you are hearing me all right. So if we're thinking about the living microorganisms that are in, living in the soils and are affected by the fire, as Jorge said before, the fire is a very good insulator. So even if you have a low severity fire, most of the microorganisms in the soil are going to be kind of all right. The problem is when you reach those high temperatures, and though that's going to kill them all, at least those in the first, you know, first five centimeters, maybe. So the first impact that we're going to have from a fire is the direct killing by the, by the heat. The second impact that we're going to find is an indirect one because, okay, the fire is gone and then they go back and their life is not the same because the habitat has changed completely. They don't have as much organic matter as they used to. So what are they going to eat? The structure is different, so where are they going to hide? Sometimes it's full of you know, pyrogenic uh, compounds that can be toxic. So those that are able to survive the heat because either they hide, they hit somewhere or they form resistant uh, propagules, once they go back, they don't find it in the same way. And so the new conditions are going to become a filter. So some species will be able to grow as much as they were before, and some others will be outcompeted by, by all the peers. And then the third kind of impact that we find is where are these coming from? Because if we think that the high temperatures just kill the first centimeters, okay, we are going to recover this microbiota either because they were hidden in the lower levels of the soil, lower profiles, or maybe they have to come from the areas that haven't been burned at high severity or haven't been burned at all. So we are finding two things now. One is that when the soil is drier, the heat goes deeper into the profile. So that means that as the heat goes down, the amount of soil that is, hard, that is strongly affected, and so the amount of microbiota that is directly killed by the heat is going to be much larger. And so the soil inoculum, the soil microbiota inoculum is going to be much smaller. On the other hand, if we think about the dispersion that comes from the areas that haven't been burned, what we are seeing now is that we might have a lower number of fire forest, uh, forest fires, but what we have is much larger. So in that sense, the capability of recovery of become, becoming this inoculum from the areas that have been burned is becoming much harder because now that those spores have to travel from much far away. So I think those would be the main uh, mm -hmm. three impacts um, that we can find nowadays. Thank you very much, Christina. Fire is not the only factor that can affect soils. Changes in land use and agriculture and forestry management can also impact soil properties. Knowing the amount of carbon in the soil is essential for implementing sustainable agriculture and forestry practice. My next question is for Ramiro Oliveri. And is there currently enough information for estimating the effect of silvicultural practices on soil organic carbon? And what is the best methodology to estimate soil organic carbon variation? Soil models or inventories, in your opinion? Yeah, thank you very much, Belen. Uh, well, uh, thank you for introducing me. I'm Ramiro Oliveri, and I work in the National Inventory uh, System of Greenhouse Gases. So our work is try to uh, get the best information of emissions. That information then is evaluated for see if Spain is uh, getting the commitments about the climate change politics. And uh, land use, land use change and forestry is the, is the most complex sector inside the inventory because we don't estimate only the emissions. We estimate a balance 
between the emissions and the absorption. And there are now there are some gaps in the in the methodology we use because it's very complex. Now about your question, now in the in in the inventory, we can estimate the difference between the when there are a land use change uh, uh, from a cropland to forest land or forest land to cropland, whatever. But uh, we don't know and we don't have evidence to know how the forest land management are improving the, the soil organic carbon, if it's increasing or not. And that's one of the gaps we have to improve the next years. And in my opinion, uh, the VETS methodology is uh, inventory because we have seen that the soils are very diversity, and even even the a fire practice, we don't know what is the effect because it depends on a lot of variables. So, in my opinion, the only uh, thing we can do is uh, do a very good inventory, and then try to improve or the between the years of the inventory, try to complete with a good. Uh, the best model we can get, but I think the uh, the only way is the the well, the best way is the inventories. Yeah. Thank you very much for for adding to the discussion. Finally, to conclude this first round of questions, I would like to ask Rodrigo Anton, who has participated in the Organic Carbon Monitoring Network in Navarra. This is a north. Uh, this is a region in the north of Spain. Uh, what is in your opinion what is your opinion about integrating elements of soil health into soil monitoring practices thank you for the question and thank you also for invitation to this fantastic event and thank you jorge for this very nice talk well the concept of of soil health can be defined as the capacity of soils to provide soil ecosystem services to 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 the society and it's not a new concept but uh, in this moment is is emerging as the new paradigm um, for sustainable soil management at least in in europe that is through the 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 soil monitoring law that is in this moment in, in revision in, in in europe and also through the ambitious goal that is proposed by also by the european commission in the soil mission that aims 100% of soils in Europe in health, in, in health, good health condition for 2050. So the concept is based on soil multifunctionality. That is interesting because allow for assessing different soil ecosystem services associated to with soils not only biomass production, but also uh, hydrological control or climate regulation or erosion control of habitat for, for um, microorganisms, other ecosystem services that uh, are very important for, for the society. Another important point of this concept is that it's based on the fact that different soils can provide different functions and different ecosystem services. And this is important as, as Jorge explained in, you know, in the presentation, because allowed to value the incredible diversity in terms of different soils that are around the world, and also the incredible uh, diversity in terms of function and ecosystem services that these soils can provide to the, to the society. Finally, it's also interesting because connect soils to the society, promoting the importance that uh, a correct and adequate soil management or land management can have on, 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 on the provision of this function to the, to the society. And having said that, the answer is, for me, is clear that, that yes, because that introduces an holistic approach and very interesting perspective in the in this in the monitoring of of 
of soil in, in, in a strategy to, to monitor soil. So, yes. Thank you very much for, for sharing your expertise. Uh, now, I would like to pose a same question uh, to all participants in this round table. And I would appreciate each of you uh, responding according to your academic and professional expertise. Uh, the question is, from your perspective, what specific challenges and opportunities does the prevention of soil degradation present in the current context of global change? Uh, Jorge, for example, if you want. I think it's necessary uh, more uh, knowledge of the soils that we have at a scale that will be use, useful for, 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 for land management, because if not, we can not do it well. And we need, for example, in terms of prevention of the catastrophic fires, we have to reactivate revita revitalization of rural areas with more land uses, sustainable, but around creating a mosaic of landscape, more heterogeneous, to protect the environment, to protect the people to the, for the fires, and to, um, to promote the more activities and economy living in these areas that is doing a, a ecosystem service for all the society, not only for, for them. So we have to, I think, push in these directions to manage this landscape in these scales, but we need to know more about the soils that we have in a good scale of, of, of cartography, for example. Thank you very much. Uh, Ramiro, yeah. what is the role of governments and policies for, in relation to this question? Mm, well, I think now in at European level, the soils are creating more important, the, now there are a directive that is in phase of negotiation, and they are trying to uh, standardize a uh, monitoring of all the countries to try to, co because sometimes ev uh, every country use uh, his uh, analysis, and then when you try to compare, it's not able. And now with that kind of with with this directive, I think it's going to be very positive. And what, in my opinion, what one of the 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 problem is that uh, we must improve the coordination. Uh, first of all, inside the administration, that we are not very coordinated, <laughs> yeah. and then to try to. Uh, have better uh, canals of communication with the researchers and try to, uh, yeah, I think that's, and, and in, because that's, if we improve the information, uh, then we can go into have better uh, police, uh, policies and a normative that improve the, that kind of things. Thank you. And uh, Rodrigo, uh, considering the, the agriculture and livestock sector, what do you think what is the, the specific challenge and opportunities that we have? Well, <clears throat> I can give you some points about what is probably the, the, the most important challenge in, in this moment that can be defined with, with, three, with three factors. The first is, is to feed more than 9,000 million population at the, at the planet. And the second is that the primary sector have to, to do that in a sustainable way. Sustainable way, meaning that uh, that must, be, must uh, be done within the natural boundaries of the, of the planet. That uh, a recent study said, the, say that we have overpassed six of, of nine boundaries of the planet in this, in this moment. Okay. And the third condition is that a uh, primary sector must do that in a global change context with the responsibility not only to, 
to 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 adapt the sector to the to this global change, but also to try to mitigate the the, the effect. So probably these three factors, three factors can just, uh, define the probably one of the the main challenges that not only private sector because it's also a challenge for the scientific community. NGO, policymakers, and society, and probably all the stakeholders possible. And remark that, of course, that soy play a crucial role in in this in this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. From your perspective, uh, what is the the opportunity that we have with the national and European research program to 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 try to find a a solution of this specific challenge and opportunity that we have. Thank you, Belen. Yeah, I've been working within the European EGP soil program lately, and I've seen that they've come out with three clear challenges. The first one is the lack of awareness. Nobody thinks about soil too much. We scientists, we are a little bubble, but even though we've been here all morning and we haven't seen much many talks about soils, because we're still putting very much the focus on what's happening above ground, and not that much into what's happening below ground, even though it's somehow the engine that turns it off. So there is a general lack of awareness. And if you think about what your families may think about it, we all know that there have to be quality for, you know, standard air quality because we breathe air and it's, you know, we all feel it touches us directly or quality standards for water because we drink it and we know it can be poisonous. There hasn't been that much thought about which are the health standards for soil because it doesn't, doesn't touch us directly. It has to go through several steps through the food chain until we actually feel what's happening. So I think that's one of the main challenges. And the European uh, Union is, is tackling that with a bottom-down approach. So what they have been doing with the mission soil is that this is, a, this is the new research and innovation program that they're putting up together within the uh, Europe Horizon program but it has a very strong focus on knowledge transfer because what they want is that the research, as, what, as Jorge was saying, is not just enough to do the research, you need to communicate it to the stakeholders. You need to let know the farmers that what they're doing is right or wrong. You need to know the public that whether they choose this kind of product or this one may have uh, consequences in the future. The second big challenge that they have found out is that there is a lack of data. We don't really know much about soil and even less about soil biodiversity. And that's when this uh, new law of soil monitoring is coming, is coming at the right time, because now we're all gonna have the same standards. Every country is gonna have to monitor soil and soil biodiversity in the same level, because only we have the data, we can know how are we doing? Are we getting better? Are we doing worse? Are the practices that we are implementing actually working? And the third challenge is that so far there hasn't been uh, legal binding for everybody, for anybody. In Europe, every state was doing, you know, basically what they thought was best. And now that comes the na nature restoration law, which is uh, under the hot debate because some people think it's enough, some people think it's certainly not enough, but at least we're walking in a direction in which every country is going to have to commit to stop degrading their environment and put a strong focus on soil. So I think those are the three main opportunities that we can see ahead. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, now I would like to invite each participant in this round table to deliver a concise takeaway message from this discussion today, a very small message. You can start that you want. Well, it's complicated in our sentence, but I think from most of us, I think that we have to transfer more the knowledge to the society more directly. It's true that the, um, from from the European projects that we have to be more in contact with all the stakeholders, but we have to do something more individually, each other, to communicate more, and then the society will ask to the politicians to change the things. Thank you. Yeah, I'm totally according with you, but I I would like to say also that I think this is a very, very good moment 
for for us for all the research or all, all soil research uh, because the society and the skate well all the stakeholders are seeing the the importance of the soils and I think that's a very good moment currently for us well, for you. Thank you, Rodrigo. For all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm um, optimist message. Um, yeah, I think that we all must work together in order to address this this important challenge because, uh, well, soils are one of the main heritage of the of the humanity and. Or less have to work in order to to understand how a correct management, soil management, a correct land use can uh, improve the soil functioning for the society. Thank you. And Christina, is your. And this is a message for all of you who are going ahead into your master's degree and your PhDs, becoming scientists, or maybe working in, uh, you know, FAO or one of those big organizations. Keep always, uh, you know, your head. Don't stop thinking about the role that soils have in how system works. And even if you don't like it, become friend of a soil scientist. You know, invite them for you know a drink, have a chat and see what kind of perspective can they bring into your research, because surely it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it whole. Thank you very much. Thank you all for you for the valuable insights and contribution to today's roundtable discussion. And now I would like to open the floor for questions from our participants and also for the uh, keynote presentation, the first one. Uh, do you have some question? No. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, this question is goes for all. Um, what do you think about biochar? It's a product. It, I think it's made of wood and with a pyrolysis process, and it said that it could improve the the structure of the soil. What do you think about it? It's like a panacea or it's just a lie? Please, when, when you ask, tell your name. In... My name is Bernardo. Okay, and where do you come from? I come from Soria. I'm making a PhD. Okay, thank um, you. I don't know much about soils, but I am first engineer. Is enough. Thanks. Thank you. What do you want to ask to answer this question about your chat? Well, what I can say about biochar, I think that it's a good strategy in order to that allow for for carbon absorption and to restore its carbon is it's a good strategy to to promote that. But there is a there is a, a, a discussion at the scientific community in relating to the to the applicability to agricultural soils. So, because the um, the carbon present and biochar is 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 not available for 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 plants in agricultural soils. The mineralization is not is not correct from the biochar. So it's a good strategy to absorb carbon and it's a good strategy to promote carbon sequestration, okay, on biochar. But I don't know if it's a good strategy to promote to to be used as as uh, organic amendment. Right. Probably Jorge can add something. Well, not specialist on biochar. So. No, me, me neither, but but it's it's like a medicine, it's not necessary. It's, it could be good only if it's necessary for some place that lose a structure or, or need more get more uh, retention of water. But as he said, it's not like an organic amendment because uh, the, the type of carbon is different. So it's like 
everything could be good if necessary in some place, but not for uh, all the areas that are degraded. Uh, maybe need another source of, of, of organic material different to be with more uh, with a more active biology in the soil. I wanted to add that it's not, we use biochar as an umbrella term. There are many different types of biochar and it can come from different kind of material. You can even get biochar out from waste plants. So that's also a tricky thing that you say biochar, but you don't really know what, what's in the end that you're putting in the soil. And that's something tricky for the industry as well to, to decide how to catalog all those type of biochars. Thank you. Any more question? Please. Uh, yeah, right here. Uh, hi. Have, sorry. Hi, no worries. Um, hi, I'm Dante. I'm from Italy. I'm uh, writing my thesis here at the, the University of Valladolid on uh, soil uh, fungal communities and uh, the effect of forest fires on these uh, soil fungal communities. Um, my first question is actually not related to um, mycology at all, but what is the status quo and uh, if you're studying, if you're working with uh, microplastics in forests currently, and what is your knowledge on the status quo of uh, microplastics? Nothing, okay, yeah. just a curiosity, okay. I don't think I know anybody that has been working with microplastics in forests. I know that there are, tend to be less there. You will find lots of microplastics when you go to agricultural soils. So far, the good thing about the forest and the forest soils is that they are in a much better shape than the agricultural ones. Okay, that was just a curiosity. <laughs> um, and as far as um, soil fungal communities, have, uh, have you worked with this at all? Uh, and well, the, the presence of, of fungal communities in, in forest soils, um, just Again, out of curiosity. I think Jorge, you've done some work. I work with forest, uh, with forest fungi mm -hmm. uh, and fires. We're actually ha we have a couple of projects going on now, okay. looking specifically at the effect of fire severity to see okay. indeed, thinking that we're going we're, we're going to see fires anyway. But what we're expecting is those these fires to be more severe in areas where they were not that much. And so the, fire, the change in fire regime is what we expect to have a large impact because the communities there might be adapted to fire, but not to that kind of fire. So we're, we're expecting to have some results soon. And if you stay until the end of the day, <laughs> I think you'll see one talk about that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more question? Here, please. Um, hi, I'm Nerea, and I'm also I'm coming from Soria, and I wanted to ask a question about salvage logging, because uh, I know a place that suffered a severe fire, and they cut all the trees down, and they said that it was to avoid the spread of diseases on the dead trees, and I wanted to know if there was an alternative for that, to don't cut the trees down, and I don't know if it, if it even was true that the diseases can spread in the trees. I do know something about that. Thank you. Yeah, it's also complicated because if you leave uh, all there, maybe also more fuel for the next fire. Also for some plague or some disease, but it, uh, I don't see disease in, in dead and good only in the trees that are damaged. So what they say that is not good from the salvage lodging is in the cases that the, you have a soil very vulnerable to, de to, to degradation, to erosion. And also do, in that moment when everything is, is very vulnerable and in this way, dragging the trunks, I don't know the way. Maybe the, the good is don't remove everything, leave something, and only remove in the places that are necessary because are 
it's dangerous for the people because if it's for, or, but leave some good in the forest is good. It's for, for the restoration of auto succession of, of microbial communities, also the vegetation, and to protect also the soil in a part. But maybe the, there is not a, a unique uh, answer about this. It's remove everything or leave everything. No, maybe it's leave something and remove a part, and if removed, but please take care about soil. Thank you. Thank you. Any more question? Hi, my name is Celia. I am researcher at G4. Um, I'm forest engineer, and when I when we usually are in a forest, we usually observe several characteristics, no, like DBH or height or structure, and we could check or we could analyze if the stand is in a good condition or in a bad condition in general. Eh? For knowing more about soils, perhaps it's difficult, but could you select uh, two, for example, two or three characteristics when you are in front of a soil profile to analyze uh, how is the status of this soil, in which in which variables do you do you or which variables do you choose to analyze the status of this soil? <laughs> Jorge. Well, uh, one is carbon. If you have carbon in the soil. Almost everything will be okay because all the soil properties are related with soil organic carbon. But also, I'm taking to my side soil structure. You have a soil, the soil structure and the picture that they put. I, I put a picture because uh, when I was with the technician in the scanning and electron microscope, going to to see another thing, say, yeah, stop, stop, take a picture of this. Because could you remember that this like a shape? Of a, the, the shape is like a heart. I, I used to compare the soil structure, the aggregation, with the heart of the soil, because it's a property that is controlled by the physical property, but controlled by the chemical and by the biology of the soil. In this architecture is, for me, reflecting how the status of the soil in terms of biology, chemical, and physical are. But of course, if I have to choose one, only um, uh, parameter, soil organic carbon. But as Christina said, we need to know more and promote more studies of soil and also about soil biodiversity, because we know that half of the biodiversity is under our feet, but we don't know exactly or almost nothing. Maybe I can add something. I agree totally with, with Jorge, but in fact, the concept of soil shells in this moment also involves the, the idea that soils are uh, living, are living. So um, in this case, if you are able to, to detect microorganisms in this soil, that is a clear indicator that the, the, the soil is in correct function and correct health. Thank you. One question more. Um, hi, I'm Dina and I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, I am. I want to ask, uh, can we increase the productivity of soil by integrating microorganisms in the soil artificially? Uh, Maybe Christina? Or, or yeah, I think Ramiro, because you have the expertise in the agriculture, oh, okay. may know. But I would say yes. And nowadays, is a it's a big line of research to find uh, beneficial microorganisms, whether they are mycorrhizal fungi or some bacteria that can promote the the growth and the absorption of the nutrients. I think it's where the big line of research is moving towards in a way that it allows to swap the chemical fertilizers and the you know chemical products that we can use even if we think about chemical products to kill pests or you know stop other kind of diseases to swap that into this kind of uh, biotic agents well i cannot just that 
that there are in this moment many people is, um, promoting this type of studies in order to develop some product that can improve the, the micro microorganism activity. Um, and yep, I said, Christina, it's uh, it's it's one of the of the new challenges in, in science. So in science, yes. I just wanted to add something because I read I read an article uh, a journal paper not so long ago in which they were comparing I think it was like twelve or fourteen of these products new biological products, and they showed that ninety percent of them didn't work because ninety percent of them didn't actually have any living organisms in there. So we have to pay attention because the industry is very smart and cheeky sometimes. So there is a lot of work a lot of work to do in that line. Thank you. Does anyone have any question? If there is no question, we finish here. Okay. Thank you all for your valuable insights and contribution to today's roundtable discussion. A special appreciation to our panelists for sharing their expertise. Thank you very much, Jorge Matais, Ramiro, Rodrigo, and Cristina. Thank you a lot. We are also grateful to our audience for the questions and participation. We look forward to continued collaboration and discussion during this meeting and in the future. Thank you very much. And now, as you can see in the meeting program, we have the poster session and coffee break. Thank you very much.